Greetings to you in the name of Jesus. Just as a way of background, this video is being shot approximately two to three weeks after the horrific tragedy that took place at the nightclub shooting down in Florida. That's the context of which this message I am sharing with you is brought to you. In the wake of tragedy, there is often the cry for some type of law to be made so that future tragedies such as what we saw in Florida can be avoided. Following the terrorist attack in Florida that Sunday morning, people have been calling for new laws, for things to be changed. The reality, though, is pretty simple. And the reality of it is that there is already a law in place that made what happened in Florida illegal. If that law had been followed, 50 lives, 50 people would still be living today. Another 53 people would not have to live with the scars and physical injuries and the emotional scars that they will endure for quite some time. Some of those that folks will deal with for the rest of their lives. This law that I'm referring to is rather an old law. It predates not only the history of the United States of America, it predates Christianity. It's a law that goes all the way back to the early foundations of Judaism. And is a law that is shared in most of the countries of the world. It's a very simple law, and if you were to think of it in terms of God's top 10, this law is number five. Four simple words, thou shall not kill. Plain and simple. Now those words might be rather self-evident, they're straightforward, it's to the point. Maybe you're thinking it's a little oversimplistic. But there is an uncomfortable reality to this law. And the uncomfortable reality is that this is a law that each and every one of us has broken. Now, I don't mean in terms of the physical killing of another individual. And no, the police are not going to be at your door with an arrest warrant. But the command, thou shall not kill, has deep meaning. Protestant reformer Martin Luther wrote a small catechism to teach the essentials of Christian faith as a guide for parents, for the heads of household in his day often men to teach the essentials of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And in so doing, he took the Ten Commandments and he wrote them out in question and answer form. So when it comes to the commandment, thou shall not kill, what does this commandment mean? Martin Luther explained it in this way. We are to fear and love God so that we neither in danger nor harm the lives of our neighbors, but instead to help and support them in all of life's needs. Now the problem with thou shalt not kill is not about the means by which we use to kill someone or to break that law. The reality is in our sinful nature, what it boils down to is that we do not care enough about God to keep the law. We do not care enough about our neighbors to obey this very basic principle. Do we love our neighbors whose sins we find more repulsive than our own? Do we love the neighbor who is always calling us, always the needy one, begging, asking, pleading for help. We don't see our neighbors the way that God sees them. 
And oftentimes we fail even to see ourselves in the way that God sees us. You see, we are sinners, not because we do evil things. Rather, we do evil things because we are sinners. That is the foundation that is very uncomfortable to realize within the depths of our own life. That we are born in this nature of original sin or inherited sin. A condition that is passed down from generation to generation going all the way back to Adam and Eve. Knowing that indeed we are gripped in this sinful nature, God gave us the gift of the law. Now he did this for several purposes. He gave this gift of the law as a way to order society, restraining the chaos that comes out of our sinful, evil, infested hearts. He also gave us this gift to bring about recognition of our own sin, our own evil within us, so that indeed we may turn to him and ask him to cleanse us from this evil nature, to make us right with him, to restore us, to that very image in which he created us. The good news is that God has heard that plea. He has heard that plea by at the very right time sending his son Jesus Christ into the world to save and redeem us. That's what it means in Galatians 4 verse 4 where we read this. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. As the angel Gabriel told Mary when he announced that she would give birth to the one who is the savior of the world, his name shall be called Jesus. Jesus was born under the law. But Jesus was born in a way that he did not inherit our sinful nature. He was born by the power of the Holy Spirit to a virgin, a woman who was pure, Mary. So that he was born outside of this sinful nature, yet born in the very real and human way truly human, and yet as the Son of God, uniquely divine at the same time. Jesus born under the law means that like every other Jewish boy of his time, like every other human being, he would be required to keep the law of his religion, that of the Jewish faith. He would be required to keep all 613 laws of the Pentateuch, those first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And yet he did. He led the perfect life. He came into a world marred by sin, marred by death marred with the infestation of evil in order to redeem you and I. Christ accomplishes what the law cannot do. Christ saves us. He saves us from the hate that dwells in our own lives. He saves us from those ill feelings that we carry within us. He put our hate-filled, sinful lives to death. How, you ask? By taking it to the cross. He suffered the capital punishment of death on a cross. A capital punishment that was due you and I. He became the hated one. He became the one we despise because he is bearing our sin, the things that we hate and despise in ourselves. 
Why? So that you and I may be made new. In the sacrament of holy baptism, you and I were united to the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, you are set free from this bondage. Jesus Christ died, put to death our old sinful nature so that we may be raised up with Christ in a new life that we don't have to wait until heaven to enjoy, but a new life we live in the here and now. And so that becomes the third point and the third use of the law that God has given us. That we obey the law, not as a reward for getting into heaven, but as a means of living a thankful life to God who has indeed saved and redeemed us. Through Jesus Christ, you have been set free. You are set free from the hopelessness that you feel in the midst of, of various circumstances. You are set free to love your neighbors, even those neighbors with whom you disagree with the most. You are set free so that the hate that seeks to reside in you may not dwell in your heart. You have been set free to live in the image in which God has made you. And that image is an image of love, God's love for you. It's not a love that condones every and any sinful behavior, but it is a perfect love of God. You are free to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And you are set free to love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor.